Good morning, church. Yeah. You know, this past uh, five weeks, we've been on a great journey. We've been looking at this thought of how do we find freedom. Finding freedom is an interesting thing. First and foremost, I realize in my life, as well as many of you that are here today with the Lord, is that we find our freedom in Christ and Christ alone, by grace alone, in faith alone, through what? Through the finished work of Christ alone on the cross. What an exciting thing to have in our lives. You know, I hope the technical difficulty doesn't, doesn't go to my, uh, to my sermon. So, yeah. Let's get going. So, you know, uh, I was thinking through this week as I was praying for all of us, you know, what the word actually you know, tr really truly means. And, you know, the word is a bomb to my soul. The word is life-giving. The word comes to us through the Holy Spirit, delivering and imparting a specific thought and, and vision to us as what we should be doing. But, you know, last week, Pastor Ryan focused on finding freedom in Christ and finding freedom through the Holy Spirit. This seems to be, in a lot of ways, a very climactic point in our series. But I want to say, this week, as we dig into Galatians chapter 6, one of the things that we're going to see is this chapter concludes with helping us to find and understand what it means to continue to find freedom as we walk through life together. Here at Awaken, we have this, you know, this thought, we're calling each other to more. We're calling each other you know, to live with one another in such a way that we would love one another in freedom and in spirit and in truth, exhorting one, you know, each other on to faith and good works. The chapter begins with practical teachings on how we are called to live in Christian community. And I want us to think about that. We are part of the same community. So before we get going, I want to just pray for us. Father, I just thank you again for your loving kindness. I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you, Lord, for your mercies that are felt fresh in you each and every day. I thank you, Lord, that even when we come and things don't seem to be going you know, the way they, they seem to, you know, they should be, Lord, everything happens in your perfect timing. So, Lord, we thank you that you've gathered us here in your name. May it be that you're, you would increase as we would decrease. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So, uh, today we're going to be looking through our concluding chapter in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. We're going to start with the first six verses. So, if you have your Bible apps, your Bibles, or if, if you don't, you can just see the words here on the back screen. Uh, you may see me taking my glasses off and on. Off and on. That's age thing. So, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, as, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one of, let each one, each one of you test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So before we dive too deeply in, I want to remind us of the context. This, is, this was happening around 50 AD. Paul was on his first missionary journey, Paul was on his first missionary journey where he planted the church in Galatia. Now, you know, at the time of this writing, this is act he was actually in his church in Antioch. So he was at the beginning, getting ready to start his third missionary journey. Church was planted. He had heard some rumblings, you know, some people that were disturbing the, those that were faithful in the church. And he, he wrote this letter specifically to them to warn them, to remind them of the grace and the freedom that they had in Christ. So as we think through... Paul takes a look at these, you know, as we look at these verses, the first thing that we're noticing is that he, he calls them brothers. You know, if I go over to my brother Gideon and I say, welcome, brother, it's a term of endearment. What I'm actually saying, what Paul was saying to us here is he was you know, saying to, to these families, we're part of the same family. Brother, sister, we're part of the same faith community. Paul's sense of community was strong. And really, that's how we should be when we greet each other, it shouldn't just be, hello, we should, we should 
take joy in greeting each other as a brother and a sister. Here at Awaken, one of our core values, in fact, is go deep and get real. Well, you know, I've started thinking about this. If I'm going to go deep and get real, that means I have to be transparent. That means I have to say things that matter. So, inevitably, when I'm in a relationship and things are going deeper, you know what ends up happening? Probably people see a little bit of sin maybe in my life. Something that needs a little course, course correction. Little course correction. Because I want to tell you, I strive for excellence, and I pray that you strive for excellence on a daily basis, but, but I know the day that I become perfect will be the day of glory, and only on that day. So until that time, I need you. I need you. And I pray you need me. However, inevitably, as I said, sin is going to start manifesting itself. And here's what is interesting. Paul says that sin is a result of our passions and our desires that have gone awry, that have gone the wrong way. You see, it's called focusing on self and what we want. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 shows us exactly what these kind of things are. So here, I'm going to give you a short list. It says sexual immorality impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, dis discord, sown between two people, jealousy, fits of rage and anger, selfish ambition, I want to put myself before somebody else, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness. These are, these are, these are good things, right? No. These aren't good things. This is what happens when we focus on ourselves. That, you know, when I think about these things, they all can be boiled down to four basic categories. Sexuality, social, spiritual, and personal. Those are the four basic categories all of, all of these things lie in. So when we're not walking the Spirit, you know what happens? What happens is the Holy Spirit will not help us along the way because we're not walking with Him. Walking is, not a, is an action verb. Now, far be it for me to be, my wife will tell you that I'm no grammar expert, but I know enough grammar to, you know, to understand that it's an action verb. It means you're doing something. Walking. First John talks to us about what it means to walk in the Spirit. So if we're not walking in the Spirit, we're probably walking in some kind of selfish you know, uh, desire that we have. What is that? Our passions and desires will get polluted, they'll get twisted in a lot of different ways. Keeping our eyes fixed on the cross is a way to not have that get polluted. On those, one of those ways sin comes out is in our sexuality. You know, I've got news for you married ones here and those that are aspiring to be married one day. Our sexuality is something that was meant to be a beautiful thing in the intimacy and in the bounds of a husband and a wife relationship. If you don't believe me, you can read it for yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 40. Tells us all about what that looks like. But you know, because of our selfish ambition, you know what happens? I see it. It turns into something immoral, impure, and sick. People get caught up in things like pornography. It's so, you know, it's just everywhere today. I'm not here to depress you. I'm here to just speak the truth. If we keep our eyes on the things that are pure, Philippians 4.8. You'll see what the, the transforming blood of Christ will do in your life. Sin also comes out socially through hatred and envy, causing divisions in the church. And again, I want to you know, remind you that this uh, epistle was written to the church. And that's what we're discussing today. What's going on inside the church? Causing divisions and factions amongst God's people. You know, if sin goes unchallenged in a person's life, if it goes unchecked, eventually that person will fail, and they will fall. And since sin is going to happen, Paul is saying to the people in, Gal in, in uh, Galatia that they should be ready. So I'm saying to you too as well, sin is going to happen in your life. And as it happens, you need to be ready. Well, you know one of the ways that I know that I can be ready? I can, ha I can be in relationship previous to the time that I've fallen into sin with brothers and sisters like you so that when you see something, hey, Gary, Brother Gary, you're going down a slippery slope. You can call me in private and you can love me enough 
to point that out to me. Church, take note. If you're trapped in sin, you will lose joy. You will lose it. And you'll stop growing spiritually. Eventually, eventually, you'll become a cancer to the others within the body because that will spill over. It will. And if you're a really charismatic person, that's probably not me, it'll spill over in really harmful ways. So Paul, here it's, it's interesting, Paul urges, uh, this is like, Paul urges our brothers and sisters, he said, you know, um, I want you to, you know, to be mature, to think about what it means, for, you know, if you're a mature Christian, what does it mean for you to walk alongside those that are not quite as mature, okay? So what does that mean? Pay attention. I don't know, I can't walk around the room here and say, Tim, you're mature, uh, 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 you know, Quincy, you're mature. That's not for me to say. That's for you to look at who you are. How are you maturing in Christ? But as a mature Christian in Christ, you are called to be watch, watchers over the church. You're, you're called to watch and to see those that are less mature. And as they're falling into sin, what do you think your responsibility is? To ignore it? To blink an eye to their sin? It's not. If you love the soul of your brother and sister, you will go to them in private and you will call them and you will say, let me walk alongside. This is how we find freedom in love. The word restore in the Greek, epinephero is the word. It has a meaning, and listen to the meaning. The meaning means mending what has been broken. Let me emphasize again, past tense. Mending what has been broken. Something has been broken. When something is broken, it probably doesn't have a whole lot of use. What do you think? Are we alive out there? What do you think? <laughs> probably not. It needs to be fixed. Well... We got a great guy here. His name is Jay Mullen. I love him. Jay can fix anything technical, I think. But I also pray that Jay can look into my soul and see if there's something going on in my life that he can walk alongside of me. That's the difference. You know, the word caught in verse 1 has a couple different flavors to it. It can kind of be like, aha, I caught you red-handed. I don't think that's what Paul was talking about. I think what he's talking about is when someone's caught in the power of sin, that they need help to escape from it. And, they, and we need, it's a trap. You know, it's like a baited hook. Only fish I ever caught in my life, I caught it by accident. So I'm not a pro, but this w analogy works. <laughs> okay? But let me just say this. You know, when I think about it, right, the hook is there. The lure is there. It, the fish is swimming through, and he sees this flashy-looking thing, and he gets attracted to it. And as he goes towards it, he gets hooked. And before you know it, you know, the, the net comes scooping up behind him. That's like sin. That's exactly like how sin is. It's tantalizing. It feasts on us. And before you know it, you're entrapped in it. You know, the nature of sin is quite a difficult thing. It sneaks up on us without us even realizing sometimes. And when we're caught in it, we need help to escape. I'm here to tell you, I can testify for myself and I'm so thankful for those that in my life have walked alongside of me and have come to me privately and sometimes even publicly maybe to say, brother, you're on a slippery slope. I don't know if you know. It's called progressive sanctification. Fancy term for, I need you. <laughs> I need you. The prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 12, interesting story. He helped you know, this, this man that you may know. His name was King David, ruler of the world at that time. What was David's sin? He had fallen in love in a lustful relationship with a particular woman that was not his wife, right? Here's Nathan. Nathan help David to confess his sin before the Lord. And then uh, uh, this took a lot of wisdom and actually a lot of courage, wouldn't you think, on Nathan's behalf? You know, people got kind of killed or 
you know, for lesser things. He's challenging the king. Why do you think he challenged the king? He challenged the king because he loved him. That he knew that this is my friend. And instead of blinking an eye to it, he risked his relationship with the king. The king that could give him everything. Well, we got a different king. He's already given us everything. I'm not willing to risk my relationship with him by just simply stepping away and living in my sin. And I want to exhort you to think about the same for yourself as well. So as we think about it, dealing with sin is not easy. Come on. Is there anybody in the room that's going to stand up and do a happy dance and say, I'm so happy when somebody calls out my sin? <laughs> We're not doing the happy dance. We probably should, though. Because when somebody calls out your sin, I pray that they do it with a spirit of gentleness. You know, I, uh, people that, who have unchecked sin in their life are really people who are missing out on what I call deep spiritual love. Because they don't have, you know, they don't realize how that person is trying to be a blessing to them. Think about that. Someone that's going to call me my sin out is a person that's trying to be a blessing? Yeah, because they love you. They care about you enough that they want to make sure that you're right before the Lord. Do you think, who in the room thinks that you can be on this journey on your own? No man, no woman. God has called us to live with one another in such a way that we would call each other on to faith and good works. And that means I need you and you need me. There's freedom in this kind of love. You know, there are some people that really enjoy pointing out other people's sin. You know, they love to attack a person's sin, you know, with guns a-blazing. Pa-pow! I got you! You know what? Because it makes them feel good. Well, that's not what Paul's asking either. With a spirit of gentleness, sin must be dealt with clearly. That's what was happening here in, in, in this chapter at this time. There were these people that were creating a, you know, a little bit of upheaval. And sin was happening. And Paul was calling them back. I think the more spiritual, spiritually mature a person is, probably the better equipped they are to walk alongside somebody to help them to move from condemnation to restoration. Let me say that again. As you mature in your faith, the better equipped you're going to be to help a brother or sister move from condemnation to reconciliation. What is at the heart of the Father? Condemnation or reconciliation? Reconciliation. Paul warns against that in verse 3. He says, matter of fact, you know, there's some, some people that are you know, kind of haughty a little bit. They, they, you know, they have the spirit about them where Paul says in verse 3, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If you, if you think that you are something when you are nothing, you're deceiving yourself. You know, somebody asked me this week about that. Well, I'd say Satan's a deceiver. That's my answer. He can deceive us by making us proud. Oh, yeah, I'm better than him. At least I didn't do have you heard that phrase before? Sure. Yeah. At least I didn't do that. Yeah. Paul says that each one of us should test our own actions through God's word, not comparing ourselves to our brothers or sisters. To test our own actions. He also makes it clear that we have to be careful so that when we're helping another person, and it's interesting, when we're helping another person, we don't become tempted along the way. This is an aspect of maturity. As you're fighting your own battles, and as you're growing in your own faith, God is going to equip you and give you victory over your own sin. But let me tell you something. I'll give you a great example. I have a friend of mine that came out of alcoholism, became a Christian, and growing. But then, you know, in his passion, 
he decided that he wanted to go help his drinking buddies and testify to them in the name of Jesus. Is that a good thing? What do you think? Is that a good thing to testify to those guys? They need Jesus as well. Except for what, one, one thing happened. Because he wasn't as strong as he needed to be, in that moment, instead of talking to them about Jesus, he became drunk. And so we have to watch out because, you know, Satan is the master hunter, not just a deceiver. He came to seek and destroy. Well, seeking is like hunting. He came to seek and destroy. And before you know it, if you're not careful, you're climbing into the very trap that you're trying to help others get out of. Another reason why spiritual disciplines need to be important to all of us, being in his word. He said, through the renewing of our mind. Verse 2, Paul goes on to talk about this whole concept of bearing one another's burdens in a way that you will fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing one another's burdens. And in verse 5, he says, For each of you should carry his own load. What in the world? It, could there be a conflict in the scripture? Are these verses at odds with one another? I don't think so. How is it possible that you can, you know, you're called to bear your own load and, uh, and bear another person's burdens? Are they not one and the same? They're not. Let me dispel that rumor. They're not. You know, I was thinking about this, and in the original text, what it was referring to is it's simply saying that a burden and a load truly are not the same. And let me tell you what the difference is. Simply put, a burden, I'm sorry, a load is something that I can carry on my own. I can carry on my own. Oops. I guess you don't have the slide. Anymore. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, technical difficulty. Okay, wrong slide. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> a burden this is there we go there's the load looks like a pretty heavy load but it looks like he's bearing up hopefully he's bearing up underneath it right a load is something that I can carry on my own I can carry this on my own okay but you know something uh, a, a burden is something that we can't we need somebody else to walk alongside to do the heavy lifting to do the heavy lifting with us let me say something to you about a load. A load is something that God wants us to struggle with. He wants us to struggle with it. Because when we struggle with it, it trains us. It's like training your muscles. It builds us up. And you know what? God's word says, you know, holding on to that, it produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character produces what, church? Hope. Romans 5, 3 and 4. There are some things that you have to learn how to just hold on to and to and to you know, it's a load that God has in, given you specifically to build your character on the other hand there's a burden there are burdens in life things that are just too heavy they're weighing us down here's an example being caught in sin we often need the help of others and pride you know God's word says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall Proverbs 16, 18. Not long ago, not long ago, actually just within the last few weeks, I had a friend uh, overseas that called me and he said, brother, I fall into the sin of lust. And I fall into the sin, you know, to this, you know, but I asked how. And he had not acted, in his mind he had acted. And you know, so he had already sinned. But in this situation, I started talking to him because we have a relationship. See, we've already gone deep. We've already you know, been real with one another. And in that situation, he confessed that to me. But we have a mutual friend in the same city. And in that same city, I called my mutual friend. He went to him. He started walking alongside of him because he couldn't bear that burden on his own. This brother started walking alongside of him. And you know what happened? He confessed his sin. He repented. And now he's on the road to res restoration. He didn't know how he was going to confess that to his wife. But this brother helped him. And he went and he confessed it to his wife. He went, he went confessed it to his, you know, to his uh, pastor at his church. And now all of us have this opportunity 
that we're taking to walk alongside of him, to see him reconciled to the king. And I believe by faith that that marriage will be stronger because this sister is seeing how, even though as devastated as she was, she's seeing how the body of Christ has walked alongside of her family. What do you think, church? Could it be? Could it be that God is asking you to behave in that same manner? I believe by faith this is a thing. There's a young sister right here in our own church. Right here in our own church. Just to bring it home. That walked alongside of her brothers. That wasn't willing to accept what was happening in their lives. But she walked along faithfully and prayed for them and presented Christ and Christ crucified in the best way that she could. Even though she was a young believer, she didn't wait to be a professional. First of all, gentlemen and sisters, we are not, there are no professionals. I got news for you. She went faithfully trusting in the king. And her brothers came to faith. She bore that burden with others in our church. That's the beauty of how the body works. You know, there are people who keep their burdens to themselves and, and they're almost crushed by the weight, crushed by the weight of their sin. Why? Why, when you know that there are people waiting in the wings that would desire to walk alongside of you, not to put you on public display, not to put a scarlet letter on you and shun you and shame you. You guys remember the book, The Scarlet Letter? What do you think? You think that was a good thing that was going on? I'm pretty sure that wasn't a way to restore and reconcile anybody. No. I will say again, let me repeat, we have to become better about understanding how to identify our loads, things that God wants us to carry for ourselves and, our, and then burdens, things that we should share with others. Now as you move on, let's read verses 7 through 10. Here God's word says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that uh, will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. You know, here we see a transition in the text. Through these verses, we see the sovereignty and the power of God in beautiful display. God cannot be mocked. He says it clearly here. He sees and knows all. I got a couple fancy words for you. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's, om he's omnipresent. He's everywhere, all the time, every in this second. He's here. He's in your homes. He's in your workplace. He's everywhere present. You can't hide from him. And eventually, you know, what Paul is warning us that uh, in life, everything really is a lot about sowing and reaping. He writes, you know, and, he, and he says in this situation that was going on in, in, in Galatia at the time, the Judaizers were pushing the circumcision for the wrong reason. You see, Paul had already come and he preached Christ and Christ crucified, the grace of Christ you have been saved. And now all of a sudden, you know, and we have it going on today, just so you know. You know what it's called today? Jesus plus. That's not my term. Jesus plus. Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross was great. But you know what? Let's go ahead and add a couple more things, just in case. So that's what these Judaizers were doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. What Jesus did was great. But you know, just in case, go ahead and put the mark of circumcision on you because we want to make sure. His grace is sufficient. His blood is sufficient. And that's the greatest news for you and me. They were trying to pollute their minds. They were masking themselves as pious and holy men. Really, they were not. Paul was warning that, you know, you can't fool God. However, we, today we have to take these things seriously. We must check our motives. 
And let me just say this to you, okay? You know, you have to make sure that the things that you're doing, that you're doing them for the right reasons, because motives are important. Do you know that it's possible for a person to be doing good, but if they're doing it for the wrong reasons, actually, this kind of thing can become a cancer to our soul. You have to be properly motivated. I'm pretty sure Jesus was properly motivated for the love of the Father and for the love of us. He came and he stayed on his mission and he stayed focused. We can learn from much from reaping and sowing. The first thing we should learn is that we shouldn't be shocked by what we reap. You know, let me ask you a question. If, I'm, if I plant an apple tree, I should probably expect to get an apple, I mean, I'm sorry, apple seed. I should probably expect to get an apple tree. Yeah? If I get watermelons, brother, what do you think? Should, you know, probably planted the wrong seed. You know, uh, this is, you know, one of the things that's interesting phenomena for me, okay, is that I was talking to a person, a particular student, not too long ago, failed an exam. And I asked, did you study for the exam? No, I didn't. <laughs> you know? And they were shocked. I didn't study, and I failed. You reap what you sow, you know. Or another particular, you know, individual I was speaking to, yeah, downed a couple pizzas. He said, man, I gained, I gained a pound and a half, and I've been doing that often, often. You know, it's not about overeating. What this is about is indulgence. You see, anything that you overindulge in probably is not a good thing. Or how about this one? This one I'm dealing with right now. You know, here's, you know, I, I, I'm aware of just this brother that I'm walking alongside in a close relationship. You know, didn't take care of his family. Not working in relationship with his wife, to love on his wife. And now he's telling me, hey, I think I'm gonna get divorced. And he's shocked. And I say to him, you didn't sow good things into your marriage. And now you're shocked at the possible result. Come on, church, wake up. If you don't sow good things, you're not going to get good things. Do I have an amen on that? But if you sow good things, you should be expectant to see good things coming. You know, behavioral science, I'm not a behavioral science guy, actually, but behavioral science tells us these four things. That thoughts guide behavior. Behavior forms habits. Habits develop our character, and character shapes our personality. Let me say again, thoughts guide behavior. Behavior forms our habits. Habits develop our character, the things that we're habitually doing. They, they form our character, and character shapes our personality. The seed that we sow in our minds, renewing our mind with good things, is probably going to breed good things. But if we indulge in lustful thoughts and petty pleasures of life, then our personality is going to be distorted and ruined. Come on. Could I be the only person sitting here realizing that? Maybe I'm the last person. So good things. God's word says when we meditate on his word day and night, our personalities will develop into the very image of Christ. A man reaps what he sows. This is a universal truth. No, this knows no boundaries, no culture. What you sow is what you will reap. You sow good, you will reap good. You sow bad, you will reap, reap bad. You know, a few years ago, you know, just to bring it home again, right here in this state, right here in this state, a person that I knew that had adopted a person from overseas. You know, here's the thing that was interesting to me. Here's this mom, you know, while she was burdened, or not necessarily burdened, but, you know, in, in you know, argumentative discussions with her son because her son was a little pesky, you know, et cetera, she, she, she said often to him, I wish he didn't exist. You know, she said, you know, like, just, you know, I, I wish you weren't here. Why are you here? One day she came home and she found her son in the backwoods hung in a tree. 
Why do you think? She sowed seeds of discord. Those seeds bore the fruit of death. But I got good news for you. I tend to be sometimes a, 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 serious, and, you know, a serious person, as you may know. If you sow good seeds, good things into the life of a brother. And I met a brother today. His name's Buddy. He's right there. Met him just before coffee, just before we came in. If Buddy and I get together and we sow good things in each other's lives, what do you think's going to happen? What do you think will happen, Buddy? Probably good things. Probably good things. Because we can exhort each other on to faith and good works and good things, growing together as the body was intended to do. Yeah, buddy, I'll give you a call. <laughs> the principle of sowing and reaping reveals the heart of the Father, reveals God's character. God is faithful to his word. God is just. God shows no favoritism, no partiality. He's living, he's watching, he's called us to be watchmen over one another. No one can escape God's watch. Why should we be deceived? Satan is trying to deceive us. You know, here, again, I'm just thinking of a situation I dealt with literally this week. Two Christian brothers, two Christian brothers. One of them came to the other and said, hey, you know, we got a serious situation here. If we just offer this bribe, yeah, I think everything, we can just make everything go away, right? Just offer, hey, blink an eye to it. Two Christian brothers. You know the one, that, the, the manager, he said to this person that offered, that was wanting to offer the bribe, hey, you know something? Someone's watching us. He looked around. I don't see anybody. It's just me and you, buddy. I'm sorry, sorry, buddy. <laughs> me and you. <laughs> just me and you. <laughs> and this is how he responded. He said, there are three of us. You see, I see you see, and God sees. Nothing escapes the view of God. So what happened in that situation? Man, this brother, the manager, he said, hey man, like, has, have you done this before? And he said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. He called him to confession. That brother repented. And I believe by faith, that there's a sense of reconciliation going on. In fact, you know why I believe that? Because he called me yesterday morning, the, the one in the story that was the briber, and he said, I feel God calling me to go back to others and to repent of what I did there. And I said, go in the will of the Lord. May you find favor in his sight. You know, when we fear God and sensing that God is watching us, this is a good thing. In Christ, we have ultimate freedom. I'm saying to you that the way that I can love you and that you can love one another is not simply to walk through life seeing things that are going on in each other's lives and not calling each other out calling each other out in a spirit of gentleness, in a spirit of freedom. Because when you're entrapped in your sin, you don't have freedom in that. There's this barrier between you and, and Christ. But when you're in that place where you're confessing and you've repented and you've felt the reconciling love of Christ, possibly through another individual in your home family, there's nothing better. God's asking us to speak these truths in our lives. So however, one of the most important things about sowing and reaping is it actually happens in time. In our time, we have become impatient. We're an impatient society. And what does that look like? I'll tell you in a second. I was thinking of my wife when I was preparing. My wife grew up on a corn and soybean farm. You know, one of the things I, I enjoy about farmers is, you know, they plant, but then they have to take diligent care to water, to weed, to fertilize. She even has a scar on her arm from cutting beans. Probably more than she wanted me to tell you. <laughs> cutting the weeds out of the fields. Patience. 
It takes consistent and faithful attitude to produce a crop. So you know what that means? Here's what it means. It doesn't mean that I'm asking you to go out and plant soybeans. It means that if my brother Gideon sees something going on in my life, then I'm asking him and I pray that he'll come to me in private, call me out in love, walk alongside of me, being patient with me, keeping the truth in front of me. Why? Because he wants me to have the same joy of the Lord that he has in his heart, to have that freedom. Paul says that we shouldn't grow weary in doing good because in their proper time, we'll reap a good harvest. This takes patience and faithfulness. So when we sow seeds of love to someone, we have to give it time to take root. You know, I did something this year that I'm probably not, you know, it, it shows to me that I'll never be a landscaper. Okay? A month ago, I decided to dethatch my grass. Right? Probably should have waited. I dethatched it. Yeah, I dethatched it really well. Matter of fact, I dethatched it so well that I took all the grass out with the thatch. <laughs> and now I look and everybody's grass in my neighborhood is green, and I'm still looking at a, a dead front lawn. Well, one, I probably should have asked somebody. You know. Two, you know, in the situation, I had a person that came and gave me advice. And you know what was beautiful about that? He gave me good advice. And it was a burden for me in a different way. But because he cared about me, and, and, and he saw that even for me, I was so stressed about this, that maybe that stress was like getting me to the point where I was like, Lord, why would you allow me to do something so stupid? Okay? Yeah. It was. But he cares about me. Took opportunity. Let us do good to all people, especially to those that are within the household of God. You see, I am my brother's keeper. You are your sister's keeper. God has asked us to live in community. That's why we have this phrase around here. And, we're, and it's not because we want to populate it. It's because we believe it. Get deep. Go deep and, and, and get real. Live a fully engaged life with one another. He's making sure that we understand that, his, uh, that he loves them enough to speak directly for, you know, you know, to them. You know, it's interesting. Let's look at verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. You know, I am social media ignorant. About two years ago, you know, my, my own daughter said to me, you know, I sent her a text message and it was all caps. And she sent me back a message saying, why are you screaming at me, or something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> Paul wrote this somewhere around 60, 60, 65 AD. I got news for you. You know, you know, he was saying to them, there wasn't even smartphones back then. Matter of fact, they didn't even have dumb phones back then. <laughs> but he said this because what my daughter was saying to me she was emphasizing, people do that to emphasize a point. You see, Paul was emphasizing a point by putting all in large letters. He was telling them. He was making sure that they understood that he loves them enough to speak firmly and gently and directly to them. He goes on to warn us by saying that we can only truly find freedom if we sincerely become a new creation. Neither circumcision or uncircumcision mean anything. What counts as a new creation? So Paul, is, what he's getting at here is not the outward actions of a man. It's what's happening on the inside. We, we need to become new creations. But this is something that we can't do in our own. Come on. Christ does this in us. But then as life goes along and the cares of the burdens of the world go along, we need each other to support each one another. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, let, you know, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold... The new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ, uh, through Christ reconciled us to himself. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He has reconciled you know, us to himself in the salvific way. But we need each other to continue to support one another, to keep our eyes fixed on the good things of Christ. I can't do this journey without you. 
And I argue that you can't do it without each other. That, that, is, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling to the world himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For, this, for our sake, he made, us, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This means that we've become a new people by the grace of God. Ephesians 2.8, I claim it. We claim it. By the grace of God we have been saved, not as a work, not, as any, not from anything that we have done of ourselves, but simply by his grace. We should be a blessing to one another and show love. You know, two sides of love. The love you know, if I'm French, I'm walking up to my wife saying, je t'aime. If I'm Russian, I'm saying to my wife, ya t'es bleu, ya t'es bien le bleu. That's the sweetness of love, right? The sweet words of love. But you know what? The sweeter words of love is when I go to my brother and I say, can we have a talk? I see something. You see, that's real, passionate love that I want to see my brother and my sister have the fullness of Christ in them, that I would be willing to risk my relationship to talk to them. Oh, what a blessing to be a member of the household of God. If you're today as a partner of our church, look around the room and count your blessings. There are ones here that will love you, I believe by faith, that if you're walking in something dark, you can come, and you find the one that you trust, and you speak to them, and you ask them to walk alongside of you. There's this fancy word called discipleship. Plug into it. Believe it. Good stuff. If you're here today not as part of the family, I want you to taste and know that he is Lord. I want you to know that living in Christ being one with him is one of the greatest things that you could ever have. You can begin that journey. God wants you to take that journey with him. He wants you to, 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 to look to him and to, to understand that being reconciled to him is not a conflict. It's a joining. My life changed 30-some years ago because of the reconciling blood of Jesus. My life changes every day because people love me enough to make sure that if they see temptation in my life, they put their hand on my back, they put my sin in front of my face, they call me to confession and repentance, and I can move for forward in faith. You know, our pastors, if, if, if the Lord is calling you in that way, some of our pastors and our life group leaders will be in the back. I would exhort you to go back there and pray with them. If this is the day that the Lord has asked you to take that step of faith, please do so. May the Lord help us all that we would find freedom in Christ today, freedom in Christ tomorrow, freedom in Christ all the days of our life. That's love. The freedom and love that we have is the freedom that we have in trusting Christ. In Christ alone. He is our way maker. He is our alpha and our omega. And everything in between. Amen.